The following program is a production of Truth For The World. Ye servants of God, your master proclaim and publish abroad his wonderful name, the name of victorious, of Jesus extol. His kingdom is glorious, he rules over all. We are continuing our series on hermeneutics, the science of interpretation and learning how to properly interpret the Bible. In this particular lesson, looking at goal, what is our goal of hermeneutics? As well as we'll be looking at some axioms, some uh, fundamental uh, truths, and we'll also look at exegesis and what that means. So let's get into the lesson and talk about the goal of hermeneutics. Why, why are we studying this? Um, and why would we want to do this? Our goal is to discover and properly interpret the meaning God has given to us through his words. We need to study to show ourselves approved, as 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15 says. Therefore, it's very appropriate to say how should we study, how should we properly interpret what God has conveyed through his words. God had meaning. God had an idea in mind. What was he trying to say? What can we interpret from his words? We want to define an axiom, A-X-I-O-M. You may be familiar with this word already, but what we're dealing with uh, as we go along will include axioms and rules. Axiom uh, may be defined like this. Every well-developed science presents or assumes certain fundamental principles which may be very briefly expressed but which contain only the most primary and essential truths of the science these are usually called axioms so if i say there's an axiom it's basically a fundamental principle or a an essential truth um, something that we have learned in the science. So as we look at the science of interpretation, what are some of the axioms, some of the essential principles, essential truths, fundamental principles? Think of it as the, um, the fundamental things we need to remember and know as we go throughout interpretation. So let's look at a few axioms in biblical hermeneutics. The true object of speech is the impartation of thought. Very simply put, the true reason for speech is to convey one thought to another person. As I speak these words, I have thoughts that enter my head, and I use my words to try to communicate to you those same thoughts. So that's an axiom. That's a fundamental principle. The reason we have speech is to impart thoughts between one party to another party. And of course, that's going to be true as we read the Word of God. We are trying to understand what God was trying to impart to us. What was God thinking and therefore communicated to us through speech, through words? What thoughts was he thinking and what is he trying to communicate to us? What are those thoughts that he's trying to communicate to us through his speech or through his words? In Ephesians chapter 3, let's read verses 1 through 4. And we'll see this is how the Bible is given to us as thoughts communicated to us through words. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Paul says that something was revealed to him by God, he wrote it down in words, and then when you read it, you can understand his knowledge that was given to him. God had ideas and thoughts and communicated them to Paul. Paul wrote them down in words and tried to communicate those to us so that when we read them, we understand. That's the axiom. The true object of speech is the impartation of thought. So as we go to the God's word, we want to say, what was God thinking? 
And what was he trying to communicate to us? What are those thoughts that he tried to communicate to us through his words? Another axiom is that language is a reliable medium of communication. Today, in a postmodernistic world, postmodernists argue there is play in human language and you may not be able to understand what I mean, even though you heard me say it. Yet they make this argument by writing books they expect you to read and understand. It's a very hypocritical way of going about it. Saying that there's not a language that's reliable in, as a medium of communication, but then explaining that to you in their own language and expecting you to listen and to understand it. The truth is, language is a reliable medium of communication. It has been since the very beginning. God spoke to Adam, God spoke to Eve, and they understood what he was saying. Another axiom is that every communication of thought, human and divine, given in the language of men, is subject to the ordinary rules of interpretation. Language is designed to convey thought. Language is a reliable method of communication. And language used by any intelligent being to convey ideas must be subject to known methods of interpretation. Otherwise, the language would be an enigma, a riddle. If I use a language to convey to you ideas, but you don't know how to interpret what I'm saying, then the communication will not occur. The truth is, God speaks to us in our own language, in the language that we know, that we would use. And that communication is accomplished, and it's subject to ordinary rules of interpretation. As Paul wrote many of his epistles, they were letters to people. Letters to an individual such as Timothy. Letters to congregations. And those letters could be interpreted just like any other letter that was written by Paul to anyone else. Or a letter written by another person to the same people. Because why? It was, used, it was written in the common language. And therefore, the same way we would interpret a book written by someone else at the same time, we would interpret the letters written by Paul. The Bible is not written in some mystical language that no one can understand. It's written in common language so that we may understand and use the same rules of interpretation. Another axiom is that the true object of interpretation is to apprehend the exact thought of the author. We go to the Bible to understand what God was trying to say to us. We do not go to the Bible to try to make it say what we think it should say. Otherwise, what's the point? Why would I write a letter to someone else just to have them put their own interpretation on it and say, well, I'm going to go to your letter and make it say what I want it to say. Well, then why should I even bother trying to tell you anything if you're just going to twist it into whatever you want? Maybe you've met somebody like that where you can try to talk to them, but then they just turn it into something different to match whatever they want. It's frustrating. Second Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. When God spoke to the apostles and to the inspired writers, they were to teach that to faithful men who could then teach that to others who would then teach that to others. And they would understand what was going on, what was being taught by God. In verse 15 of the same chapter, Give diligence to present thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, handling aright the word of truth. Give diligence, work hard, to apprehend what God wants to say to you through his word. And this is how God has spoken to us. In Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, God, who at sundry times and in divers' manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. This is God speaking to us. The Bible contains the words and thoughts of God, and that's how he communicated to us. We need to give diligence to understand what God was trying to communicate. That's the point of hermeneutics, trying to understand and properly handle the word of God, handling aright, 
or handling properly, as Second Timothy 2.15 says, handling properly the Word of God. We can go to the Bible and make it say all kinds of things that aren't true, but instead we need to go to the Bible and handle it properly to understand what God really meant in the first place. Another thing we have to be aware of as we look at hermeneutics is all sufficiency of the scriptures, that the scriptures are all sufficient to learn what God has wanted us to learn. Maybe you've heard of the law of non-contradiction. This basically states two opposing statements cannot both be true under the same circumstances at the same time. If you have two statements that contradict each other, that are opposing statements, both of those statements cannot be true under the same circumstances. If I say right now I am sitting down and at the exact same time I, I, I am saying right now I am not sitting down, those are opposing statements. They cannot both be true under the same circumstances. If you were testifying in court, I did not shoot that man, and then later you testify, I did shoot that man, those are opposing statements, and under the same circumstances, they can't both be true. Well, the scriptures claim to be all-sufficient. So, based on the law of non-contradiction, they either are all-sufficient or they're not. They first claim to be all-sufficient. Let's notice that. The scriptures do claim to be all-sufficient. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. How equipped is the man of God with the scriptures? He's truly furnished, totally furnished for doctrine, instruction, reproof, rebuke, whatever he needs. The doctrine and the instruction and the reproval and the rebuking, it's all included in the scripture. In Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Through the knowledge of Jesus, through the knowledge of what God has taught, we have all things that pertain to life and godliness. Do you want to know how to live? Do you want to know how to be godly? You can know it through the scriptures. They are all sufficient. As Jude verse 3 says, Beloved, while I was giving all diligence to write unto you of our common salvation, I was constrained to write unto you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered unto the saints. We understand that we do not have new revelations because the scriptures are all sufficient. The scriptures were once for all delivered, and therefore the scriptures are either all sufficient or they're not. The scriptures claim to be all-sufficient, so either they are all-sufficient or they are not. It doesn't matter what I say. If I say the scriptures might be all-sufficient, they're partially sufficient, that really doesn't matter because the scriptures claim to be all-sufficient, and therefore we have to determine are they all-sufficient or are they not. Now, since the scriptures claim that they are all sufficient, we can determine either, number one, they are not all sufficient and the Bible's claim is therefore incorrect. If the Bible's claim to be all sufficient is incorrect, the Bible has errors. If the Bible has errors, it's not inspired of God. And if it's not inspired of God, it's trash. It's basically worthless. So if the scriptures claim to be all-sufficient and they are not all-sufficient, then it's trash. The other option is the scriptures are all-sufficient as the Bible claims, and therefore any additional revelation is either insufficient because it contains less than the Bible, it's redundant because it contains the same as the Bible, or it's superfluous because it contains more than the Bible. Any additional revelation should therefore be discarded, including, but not limited to, personal feelings of revelation, alleged Holy Spirit nudgings, guidance, or revelations separate and apart from, or in conjunction with, the Bible, 
alleged new revelations by persons in alleged authoritative positions, such as self-proclaimed apostles, appointed presidents, or those claiming to be prophets. If the scriptures are all sufficient, we do not need new revelations, we do not need direct operations of the Holy Spirit, and we do not need modern-day apostles, presidents, or prophets telling us new revelations, because the scriptures are all sufficient. Any additional revelation is insufficient because it contains less than the Bible, redundant because it's the same as the Bible, or it's superfluous because it contains more than the Bible. Either the scriptures are all sufficient or they're not. The instant we believe we have any additional revelations, nudgings, callings, or other direct influence from God on demand, separate and apart from the Bible, the Bible is no longer all sufficient, and it's false. Any other direct influence from God on man, separate and apart from the Bible, is basically stating that the scriptures were not all sufficient, God had to directly influence us, and therefore the Bible's claim to be all sufficient is incorrect and false. And if it's false, the whole Bible can be discarded, because it's not inspired of God if it's got errors in it. So the scriptures are all sufficient. We want to look also at the idea of exegesis over eisegesis. Exegesis over eisegesis. When we go to any scripture, we want to use exegesis rather than eisegesis. Exegesis is from the Greek word ex, ex, meaning out or out of, and another word meaning to lead or guide, to lead or guide out. We're leading out of the text only what is in the text. We're only trying to pull out of the scripture what God put there, in other words. We're not trying to interject our own meanings. We're approaching the scripture as an empty vessel, ready to be filled with the information God has for us. We approach the Bible saying, God, tell me what you want me to learn. Let me go, as we said before, to the author to understand what he was trying to say. Not going to the author and telling the author, let me tell you what I think you are saying. That would be eisegesis, putting into the text the meaning you want to put into the text. You can go to the Bible and approach it with an idea or doctrine already in mind and then interpret the Bible accordingly. You can say, this is what I believe, and I'm going to go to the Bible and prove it and make it so. I'm going to put into the text the meaning I want to put into the text. Well, we can make the Bible say almost anything we want if we practice eisegesis. But that makes the meaning subjective. And we're not really interpreting the Bible to find out the meaning God had for us. We're going to God and telling him something. And that's the opposite of what that communication was meant to be. Remember the axiom, the true object of interpretation is to apprehend the exact thought of the author. It doesn't make a lot of sense for me to open up a book and start telling the author what I think is correct because now I'm ignoring what the author said to me. If I want to ignore what the author said to me, why would I pick up the book in the first place? We also want to remember that we want to use this axiom. No matter which scripture we look at, we want to remember the true object is to apprehend the exact thought of the author no matter which scripture we go to. Now what I mean by that is part of biblical hermeneutics is using scripture to interpret scripture. Since the Bible is perfect, we can sometimes look at how a word or phrase is used in one instance in order to interpret what it means in another instance. However, we need to be open-minded. So if we use biblical hermeneutics and we say, how can we better understand this scripture? Let's go read more scripture. We want to be open-minded enough to allow for the possibility of error in the interpretation of the first scripture. Let's say we have two scriptures. Let's call them scripture A and scripture B. If I interpret scripture A and I think I've done it correctly, I come up with a certain meaning. If I go and read Scripture B, and Scripture B seems to contradict my interpretation of Scripture A, 
I don't want to necessarily twist, I don't want to twist the meaning of Scripture B to make it fit my interpretation of Scripture A. If I find out that two scriptures are contradicting each other in their interpretation, it's the answer is that I've probably interpreted one or both of them incorrectly. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say we use exegesis on scripture A and exegesis on scripture B. We don't want to use eisegesis on any piece of scripture. We should not practice exegesis on one scripture to come up with an interpretation and a meaning only to use that interpretation to practice eisegesis on another scripture without fully examining the exegesis on the second scripture. If you interpret scripture A and you think you got its interpretation, don't go to scripture B and force that interpretation on scripture B. That's eisegesis. That's forcing your idea of what scripture B should say based on your interpretation of scripture A. Instead, every time you approach any scripture, whether it be A or B, use exegesis to say, let me try and interpret what God is trying to say to me. If it turns out that your interpretation of scripture A and your interpretation of scripture B contradict each other, well, don't panic. It simply means you've probably interpreted one or both of them incorrectly. Go back and try again. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, we read this, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now this may be interpreted as God put our sins onto the account of Christ, as if he became a sinner, made him to be sin for us, as Jesus became a sinner. But if I interpret that that way, and then I go over to Matthew chapter 27 and verse 46 and read about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I might use those two scriptures and say, why would God forsake Jesus? It must be because he had sin on him and God cannot look at sin. Well, what am I doing? I'm taking the interpretation, perhaps to some degree, of Matthew 27, 46, and I'm making it say what I want it to say because of my interpretation of 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Matthew 27 doesn't say that God really forsook Jesus. Was this question rhetorical? Was Jesus just quoting scripture, which you can actually read this in the Old Testament? Did God really forsake him? And in order to try to understand that, we might say, well, God must have forsaken him, and it must be because he had sin on him, and God can't look at sin. In reality, God never forsook Jesus, and Jesus never had the account of, of sin imputed upon him. Otherwise, he would never have been a perfect sacrifice, and we would not have a Savior. We're not going to go into all the details of the interpretation of these verses right now. The point is we do not want to allow our interpretation of one passage to let us negate the necessity of properly interpreting the second passage. Properly interpreting both passages will let us know more. If both passages harmonize, then we're probably on the right track. Isaiah 59, 1 through 2 says, The Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor his ear so dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between your, you and your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. It is true that God will not look up, uh, or cannot take sin in his presence. But is that really why Jesus said what he said? We don't want to take one interpretation and force it on another without properly exegeting the second one. So we want to use scripture to interpret scripture. There's nothing wrong with that. It's good. But if both passages harmonize, we're probably on the right track. If one passage contradicts the other, then we've probably translated one or both incorrectly. We can't be lazy about interpreting the second passage by painting it with the meaning we got from the first one. 
Proper hermeneutics tells us we can use a second scripture to help interpret the first one. However, it does not give us the liberty to be lazy about interpreting the second one by painting it with the meaning we got from the first one. That would be like interpreting John 3.16 to say, if you believe you'll be saved, then interpreting Mark 16.16 and saying that baptism is not really necessary because I already interpreted that belief was sufficient from John 3.16. Right? Maybe you've heard that. I think I've heard people talking like that. As if John 3.16 or some other verse says, If you believe, you'll be saved. And then when they read Mark 16.16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And they they then paint the second passage of Mark 16.16 with their own previous interpretation of another passage and reinterpret Mark 16.16 from saying, Well, baptism isn't really necessary. It's 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 You only have to believe. If you look at Mark sixteen sixteen, the, the it's pretty obvious what it's trying to say. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. It's very straightforward. Therefore, if Mark sixteen sixteen says baptism is necessary for salvation, and you've interpreted John three sixteen to say baptism is not necessary for salvation, you've got two opposing statements. You've got two opposing interpretations, and those both cannot be true. You have interpreted one or both of those incorrectly, and you need to go back and do it again. We cannot use exegesis on one passage only to turn around and use eisegesis on the other passage. If you would like a free Bible correspondence course, then write us. At Truth for the World, P.O. Box 241, Bethel Springs, Tennessee, 38315, The United States of America. Or visit us online at truthfortheworld.org. Would you follow Jesus for a fish sandwich? When Jesus fed a large group with a few loaves of bread and two fishes, the crowd followed him. Jesus told him in John chapter 6, verses 26 and 27, You seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. They followed Jesus, hoping to get more food from him to satisfy their physical needs and desires. Jesus told him to work for the spiritual meat which does not perish. It may sound crazy to follow someone because he will give you a fish sandwich, but many today will choose a church because it is close, it is where their parents went, they have fun activities, they have lots of fellowship and social fun, or maybe they just serve fish sandwiches. If you would like a free Bible correspondence course, then write us at Truth For The World, or visit us online at truthfortheworld.org. Ye servants of God, your master proclaim and publish abroad his wonderful name, the name all victorious of Jesus extol. His kingdom is glorious, he rules over all.